Welcome to Library Seminars, a platform for the presentation of ideas, research, and news in support of NOAA's mission. I'm Lisa Clark, Reference Librarian at the NOAA Central Library. Today's presentation, Social Science and Workforce Excellence, is, is the first in a five-part series sponsored by the NOAA Research and Development Enterprise Committee, focusing on the NOAA Science Report. Neil Christensen, the OAR representative from the committee, will introduce the speakers. Before I hand the mic to Neil, here are a few logistical tips to help you enjoy our presentation. If you're having trouble with the audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, please log out and rejoin us. This resets the software and resolves most technical issues. Our presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later today. We want to hear your questions, so please feel free to type them in the questions chat box on the right side of your screen at any time. However, let us know to whom the question is addressed by indicating the name of the person you'd like to answer your question. All questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. So with that last detail, let's get started. The mic is all yours, Neil. Thanks so much, Lisa, and thank you for, your, uh, for the library support in uh, the logistics for this call and for hosting it. Um, I am very excited to be here representing um, essentially the NOAA Science Council, but specifically uh, the NOAA Research and Development Enterprise Committee, which is a key committee under the NOAA Science Council. So uh, my name is Neil Christensen. Uh, I am the OAR representative to the NOAA Research and Development Enterprise Committee, and, which is a cross-line office committee, as I said, under the Science Council. And the RDEC, as we call it, is responsible for the development of the NOAA Science Report uh, with input from co contributors across NOAA. So uh, among uh, the committee works on many other uh, tasks that are assigned to it by, by the Science Council. Um, the sponsors for the seminars include the, the RDEC and the NOAA Central Library. And again, thank you to all the library staff for making this uh, making this possible. The NOAA Science Report is an annual report that highlights NOAA's scientific accomplishments for the year, and it reflects NOAA's research priorities as well. The NOAA Science Report especially celebrates NOAA's research and development in four sections. It has an introduction, science highlights, which are the bulk of the report, bibliometrics, um, which are, again, the library helps us produce those uh, bibliometrics, and uh, a section on NOAA's scientific workforce. Together, these sections highlight how NOAA's research products impact the lives of all Americans and how important that research is. The 2020 NOAA Science Report will be released later this month on the NOAA Science Council web website, and I'm sure you'll see an announcement about that in your email when that's released. The report spans the entire range of NOAA's mission. It represents NOAA's mission, and there are more than 60 stories or highlights featured in the 2020 NOAA Science Report, stories that represent the accomplishments of NOAA employees as well as NOAA's partners. Um, we can't do this work without our partners uh, at, uh, at universities, private institutions, organizations, other agencies, international partners. Those all are critically important to our work. So today we're focusing on um, five speakers whose work features social science. It showcases NOAA's excellent workforce response to COVID-19, and it highlights NOAA's educational opportunities, such as the Hollings Fellowship. The full bios for the speakers today can be found um, in the website description of today's webinar. So I'm just going to quickly read off the names um, and their affiliation. So first up, we have Andrew Carr Harris, who is an economist with ECS, contracting in support of the NOAA Northeast Fisheries Science Center, Social Sciences Branch. Second, we'll have Monica Grasso. Monica is the chief economist at the NOAA PRSSO, Office of the Chief Economist. Jennifer Schwang also contributed to the work that Monica will present. And Jennifer is an economist at Integrated Systems Solutions, contracting in support of NOAA, NOAA PRSSO. Our third presentation will be by Shoba Kondragunta, a research scientist with NOAA NESDIS STAR, Satellite Calibration and Data Assimilation Branch. And the, our fourth presenter today will be Anna Klompen, 
PhD candidate and chan chancellor's doctoral fellow with the University of Kansas Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Each of the speakers will give a 10 minute presentation and then we'll have question and answer session after all of the presenters have presented. So please hold your questions. Please, um, I encourage you to ask questions. Um, we never have enough time for questions and discussion. So, um, uh, but it's, it's critically important to exchange ideas and do this coordination and communication. So um, with that, I'd like to invite Andrew Carr Harris to kick off our presentations. And Andrew, are you ready? Yep. Great, take it away. All right, hi everyone. My name is Andrew Carr Harris. I'm an economist with the social sciences branch at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. So I'm located in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And today I'll be talking about uh, some research I did regarding management of the recreational Atlantic striped bass fishery. The key takeaway of this research is that understanding the link between fishing regulations, fishing effort, and fish mortality can help support the development of regulations that are good for fish stocks and good, or at least not terrible, for recreational anglers. <clears throat> Atlantic striped bass are a very popular species uh, recreationally along the Atlantic coast. In fact, they're typically the number one targeted and harvested recreational species by weight in the country. Compared to the commercial sector, the recreational sector typically accounts for the lion's share of total numbers of uh, dead fish. So uh, they accounted for 87% of total fishing mortality in 2019. As a prized game fish species, catch and release fishing is also very popular. And trophy sized fish, such as the one in this picture, are highly sought after by anglers. However, removing too many of those large trophy sized fish can have adverse stock impacts because those fish are predominantly female spawners. Here are some key results from the most recent stock assessment. On the left, we have uh, the trend in total fishing mortalities uh, beginning in the early 80s. And on the right are trends in female spawning stock biomass over the same period. There are two key management objectives in this fishery. The first is to maintain fishing mortality below the biological threshold. And the second is to maintain female spawning stock biomass above the biological threshold. The most recent stock assessment showed that both thresholds had been surpassed. And in 2019, the fishery was declared overfish and experiencing overfishing. So in response to this, the coastwide recreational regulations changed from anglers being able to keep one fish uh, greater than 28 inches in length in 2019 to being able to keep one fish between 28 and 35 inches in 2020. And the 2020 cap on the maximum size of fish that could be legally kept was implemented largely to protect those large female spawners. Our research objective was to evaluate striped bass angler preferences for sizes of harvested fish and trade-offs with bag limits. And this came directly from the management plan review documents. We took it a step further and we asked what types of fishing policies would likely reduce fishing mortality, increase female spawning stock biomass, both of which would be favorable to the conservation objectives of the management, but also maximize angler satisfaction or welfare. So I'll use the term welfare, and that is a concept, concept that economists use to put a dollar value on satisfaction. So to do this, we administered a, uh, a survey to recreational striped bass anglers along the coast from Maine to Virginia in uh, 2016. The survey took about a year to develop and administer. Uh, we had to carefully craft questions that would allow us to meet our research ob objectives uh, and devise a sampling strategy to effectively reach the target population of anglers. We also, uh, pre-tested the survey instrument during focus groups in three separate states along the coast. This was done to ensure that anglers in all regions could interpret and answer the questions as we intended. The, the survey instrument changed considerably uh, from the first to the last focus group. Um, so those were really important uh, for developing it. The key component of the survey was something called the discrete choice experiment which is an approach that economists use for evaluation of non-market goods or attributes. 
In our case, those attributes were uh, keeping and releasing small, medium, and trophy size striped bass. So in each of these choice questions, uh, respondents were presented with three options, two fishing trip options and the option of not going fishing, and they were asked to choose their favorite option. Uh, the two fishing trip options uh, were composed of different features, uh, including the number of small, medium, and trophy sized um, fish striped bass that would be that could be kept and must be released, and the cost of the trip. So these values of the, the different features were randomized across each of the choice questions, and there were four in each survey. And we had 20 different versions of the survey, each with a different set of four discrete choice experiment questions. So we used the variation in the attribute levels uh, within a, and across choice questions and you know, anglers' responses to tease out the relative contribution of each of these features on overall angler satisfaction with their trip. Because we included trip cost as one of the features, we were able to actually uh, calculate welfare or the dollar value of that satisfaction. We then incorporated those survey results into a simulation model. So essentially, we recreated the recreational fishery in 2015 in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island under the policy that was in place at that time. We calculated baseline levels of welfare and fishing mortality, and then we imposed a variety of alternative policies that varied in the possession limit and the size limit. So when we did this, a few things happened. Uh, most importantly, the, uh, there's some sort of change in fishing effort because the regulations affect the number of fish that can be kept and uh, must be released. Um, so as, tr as fishing becomes more or less attractive to anglers, there's some change in the total number of fishing trips that would be expected to occur. This causes three things to happen. First, there's a change in the total number of dead fish from the recreational sector. There's a change in dead female spawners. And also there's a change in angler welfare. And all those are relative to the actual 2015 uh, policy and fishing conditions. And it is these three outputs that we calculate from the simulation model. Here's uh, an example of, of our survey results. So we found that the value of keeping one trophy size striper was about $32, which was equivalent to keeping 1.4 medium stripers or 2.2 small stripers. Additionally, we found that releasing one trophy striper valued at about $16 was equivalent to keeping 0.7 medium size or 1.1 small stripers. And this kind of highlights the sport fishing nature of the fishery where anglers place a high value on keeping or releasing trophy sized fish. So we use those results to calculate welfare impacts. But importantly, the survey results allowed us to predict the total number of fishing trips that might occur under different regulatory scenarios. So this is that simulation modeling uh, part of it. And here are those results. So plotted are the 36 policies we evaluated, each with uh, uh, a different bag or possession limit and size limit. On the vertical axis is uh, the percent change in angler welfare relative to the baseline. And on the horizontal axis is the percent change in dead female spawners relative to the baseline. So policies above the crosshairs are good for anglers. Those below are not so good. Policies to the right of the crosshairs are those expected to reduce the number of dead female spawners relative to the baseline, and those to the left are expected to increase the number of dead female spawners relative to the baseline. So I've highlighted the least and most restrictive policies that we evaluated. In the top left, policy A2 was a two fish possession limit um, and the minimum size limit of 20 inches. This policy was expected to lead to the largest increase in angler welfare, uh, primarily because it, uh, those smaller fish are more frequently encountered uh, than the larger fish. And for the same reason, it was also expected to lead to an increase in the number of dead female spawners relative to the baseline. On the bottom right, uh, we have a policy E1, a one fish 28 to 36 inch slot. This policy came with a slight reduction in angler welfare, not by much, uh, less than 5%. And it was also expected to reduce uh, the numbers of dead female spawners relative to the baseline. So if we remember the actual 2020 policy uh, that was implemented, 
it was a one fish 28 to 35 inch slot. So essentially the same policy here that we evaluated E1. If we were to stop there, um, and if managers only cared about female spawning stock biomass, we could say that the 2020 policy was suboptimal and that there are several different policy options that would have led to higher reductions in dead female spawners and actually increased angler welfare. And those policies are in that little dotted box there. However, remember there are two key conservation objectives of the fishery. It's to maintain sustainable levels of female spawning stock biomass, but also sustainable levels of total fishing mortality. And these, the second set of results gets at the fishing mortality part again. Um, so again, we have uh, on the vertical axis, the percent change in angler welfare. Now on the horizontal axis, we have the percent change in uh, total numbers of dead fish relative to the baseline, which is a proxy for fishing mortality. So we can see that only one of the policies we evaluated, policy E1, was expected to lead to a reduction in total fishing mortality. So with this secondary set of results, we can now uh, conclude that the actual policy in 2020 was a pretty good choice given that uh, the policy we evaluated was the only one expected to lead to favorable outcomes in both uh, total fishing mortality and uh, female spawning mortality. So more broadly, this research uh, highlighted the importance of understanding the link between fishing regulations and fishing effort. Um, it allows analysts to evaluate the potential impact of proposed policy on angler welfare, which is often overlooked, but also their impact on key conservation objectives, such as total fishing mortality and female spawning stock biomass. Uh, ultimately, by considering these impacts jointly, managers would be better able to balance socioeconomic and conservation objectives of fisheries management. If you want more details, check out the paper, um, and thanks everyone for listening. Fantastic, Andrew. Thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Monica Grasso. Monica, you ready to go? And um, we're just going to see Monica's uh, slides. We're not going to see her her face. Can, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Neil. So, so um, I'm I'm very very excited uh, with the opportunity to present our work here today. And uh, before I start, I just want to say a big thank you to to the main contributors to this uh, project. And this is um, OCM, Kate Quickly, and uh, from um, our office, uh, uh, Performance Risk and Social Science Office, uh, Jennifer Zwang and Jeff Atkins. So let me just uh, change my slides. Okay. So, um, on June last year, uh, NOAA and the Bureau of Economic Analysis published the economic statistics, ocean economic statistics, and this is a prototype statistics. Um, this is a, a joint project that is a result of more than three years of collaboration between NOAA and BEA and builds on decades of uh, work to define and measure the ocean economy. And just for the folks that are not really familiar with the, the Bureau of Economic Analysis or BEA, they are um, our sister bureau. So they are also under the Department of Commerce and they are uh, the agency that is um, responsible for providing measures of the U.S. economy. So one of the, the products that are well known is our GDP, the gross domestic product. So uh, the statistics are measuring ocean dependent activities and industries contribution to the U.S. economy. And we covered the period of 2014 and 2018. It is consistent with the, the BA's methodology to develop the core economic statistics, uh, such as the GDP. And in addition, um, we uh, these statistics also include information based on extensive research, expert consultation, 
an engagement with uh, industry and uh, with uh, academia as well. So these are, I'll say these are the most comprehensive and accurate ocean statistics that, we, that have been produced to date at national level in the US. It is a prototype though, and we are expecting to uh, make major refinements uh, this year. So um, one of the other uh, great uh, things of this uh, statistics is that um, this work was also performed in collaboration with other nations, such as Portugal, Ireland, and also the organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. So this uh, collaboration definitely demonstrates the US leadership and representation in the international efforts to understand the importance of ocean dependent economies. So um, how do we define the ocean dependency? I'll say um, for this pro uh, project, the first and probably the most difficult and important uh, step was the, the development of our definitions. And I'm glad to say that those definitions are also consistent with uh, the international standards. And so how do we define? So we define uh, ocean dependency as um, activities that takes place um, in the marine environment, such as uh, say the marine transportation, uses uh, essential inputs from the marine environment, like seafood processing, uh, produce goods and services mainly for use in the marine environment, for example, and uh, navigational equipment, and will not take place if not located in uh, proximity to the marine environment. And that's a case of hotels and vacation rental properties. So uh, just to clarify, this um, statistics uh, covered the US oceans, the EZ, the Exclusive Economic Zone area, but also uh, major water bodies, such as uh, Gulf of Mexico, Chesapeake Bay, uh, Puget Sound, Great Lakes. In addition, uh, it covers uh, the U.S. shoreline directly adjacent to these waters, and also inland waters leading to international uh, shipping terminals. But the most innovative aspect of the statistics is that we are also measuring ocean-dependent activities occurring inland areas in inland areas in the U.S. And for that, we develop uh, coefficients, what we call partials, to measure the portion of the US economy receiving essential inputs from the marine waters. And this is a, a major achievement and uh, it could not have been done without the help of um, you know, all the know knowledge that we built all those years on trying to understand the, the ocean economy. So why is this important and how this can be used? So as I mentioned before, this is the most uh, comprehensive and accurate statistics we have so far. And it definitely uh, deepens our understand of the US uh, ocean economy. And understanding the, the size and scope of the US economy will help for inform government agencies, private investors, and entrepreneurs on issues related to policy and future investments. The information is helpful to for policymakers, industry advocates, and organizations considering investing in new and, and growing markets. It can also help to identify vulnerable industries and develop targeted programs and investments. In addition, uh, if this information is maintained over time, it can be used to monitor trends, uh, highlight emerging industries, and show dependencies uh, between industries. 
And in the case of COVID-19, the current data is the baseline for measures of the COVID-19 impact on the ocean economy. And future updates and runs uh, will enable us to identify the magnitude of the impact in the most affected industries. And here are the 10 sectors. So we developed statistics for uh, 10 uh, distinct sectors. And uh, for those sectors, we have um, more than 40 industry uh, groups included. Most of the sectors are self-explanatory. I'm not going to uh, spend much time, but I just want to highlight some of them, for example, fisheries and other bioproducts that do include, of course, the, the commercial fisheries, um, seafood processing markets, but also includes the merging marine pharmaceutical industry. So this is um, an emerging industry and we just start measuring. So it's, it's very exciting to, to be able to see how this is going to change in the future. Uh, we also include the research and education. So it includes uh, the government industries, academia labs, um, and schools, uh, and other uh, organizations' investments on the marine research and education. Professional services, that is all that the Valsi financial trade, even legal services rela related to, to ocean um, activities. Then we have uh, dredging, restoration, I think it's self-explanatory. Um, national defense and administration, uh, public administration, we have defense and non-defense investments. Then we have uh, uh, offshore oil and gas, marine transportation, shipbuilding, tourism recreation, and uh, power generation. I just want to highlight that for now we have um, only uh, traditional electrical power at this point, but we are planning to be able to include renewable energies uh, as it reaches uh, measurable levels. So um, just to highlight again, so the methodology uses um, the BA framework and um, input, it's an input output model. It has approximately 5,000, over 5,000 goods and services. We use dozens of um, uh, data sources. We have a very comprehensive um, document uh, with all detailed uh, data sources that we use to develop our statistics. And again, it's, uh, our methodology is consistent with uh, other countries. Just uh, to give you a high level, some high level results. So um, in 2018, we found that the marine economy of the US accounted for 1.8% of the GDP. This might sound uh, small, but it's about the same share um, as in other mature, complex economies around the world. And uh, it tends to be larger in countries that don't have large interior regions. Um, we have some, some um, figures, for example, Ireland I have is 1.1, uh, Portugal, the, they, they just had a recent release, it was 3.1, but I think it's about four right now, Canada 1.5. And you also can see uh, the compensation and employment numbers. Uh, this next slide, I just uh, just for you to have an idea of the magnitude of the ocean economy. So in the previous slide, you saw that the ocean economy accounts for less than 2% of the national total GDP. This slide is meant to provide you some context for interpreting this number. The US economy is so diverse that individual sectors don't normally account for a large share of the total economy. So in this slide, we show three sectors that people intuitively, intuitively know uh, and know that uh, that is an important sector. And you can see comparing to the ocean economy, Ocean economy is, is really significant. It doesn't mean that other sectors are, uh, there are other sectors that are uh, much more significant, but you can see that uh, the ocean economy 
is a good good portion. And this slide, um, I think there are two major uh, points to make about this slide. First is that the ocean economy grew about the same rate as the US economy as a whole in uh, 2018, a bit faster in GDP and gross output and a bit slower in comparison to employment. Uh, and second, the economy is likely like any other sector of the economy, some years are better and others not. So here we have the 2018 numbers. And just uh, to illustrate in this slide, just want to show you the percentage contribution from each activity. Um, and uh, you can see that tourism and recreation is significant portion of our ocean economy as uh, um, as well the national defense and public administration but it's um, really uh, good to see that tourism recreation has big big portion and here i think is one of my last slides just to show you the emerging industries that we found that we are we're going to continue. We're tracking those industries. We're going to keep tracking, and hopefully, we'll be able to incorporate more information in the future runs. And that's aquaculture, marine pharmaceuticals, ocean exploration, offshore renewable energy, and autonomous uh, marine vehicles. So we are currently working with BA uh, to adjust our numbers, adjust to inflation. The first one was not adjusted to inflation. We are developing specific industry profiles. We have some that were uh, already released and uh, we're putting most of the information at digital coast. Uh, we continue to release um, data for um, future years, hopefully uh, depending on funding, but we're going to have um, data for 2019 for sure, uh, hopefully by June this year. And you know, we are always open to receive feedback. We have been talking with industries and other associations to be able to improve our measures. And uh, just a big thank you to all. Um, and if you like to see more specific information and, and the data, you can go to, to the BA website. Here is, is the link. And if you have any questions, please contact us. We, um, our email is oceaneconomy at NOAA.gov. Thank you. Monica, thanks so much. That was fantastic. One of the things that gets me so excited about your presentation is the connections, highlighting the connections from the research that you do to <clears throat> a lot of the other research that NOAA does and, and fisheries. The presentation that Andrew made, for example, you know, seeing how that connects to uh, the ocean economy, um, it, it helps us all understand how valuable our work is as well as how um, it reflects to um, folks outside NOAA um, how valuable that work is. So that's fantastic. Um, our next um, our next speaker is Shoba Kondragunta. Shoba, are you ready? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go right ahead. Okay. Thanks. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for participating. Uh, I'm going to speak to you all about relating human activity during uh, COVID-19 lockdown and uh, its impact on air quality. Um, so the COVID-19 pandemic has been tragic in many, many proportions and uh, many angles, every which way you slice and dice. But for the scientific community, what it provided, it provided a window into the future to see what a scenario of improved air quality can look like. And that happened because of the reduced uh, human activity during the lockdown when different countries went into the lockdown measures. And that's what I'm going to talk to you all about. So every year, uh, air quality kills many million people. In 2018, globally, kill like 8 million people. 
and exposure to pollution, uh, traffic pollution in particular, um, increases the incidences of uh, childhood asthma. So one, one thing about the air quality is that it uh, doesn't have the shock value like, like a tornado, severe weather, like a tornado or a hurricane. It doesn't kill people instant, instantaneously. What, what it does, it kind of like degrades the overall quality of life and prolonged exposure eventually does kill. But so that's why you in the news media, you hear about these events, but not to the degree of you don't get the coverage like you get for hurricanes or a tornado and events like that. Um, so what's the source of uh, pollution? Uh, one of the sources of pollution is the transportation sector. So when, when there is human activity, when we are going from one place to the other, or like, you know, for goods and stuff like that. So there is always a, a transportation sector is involved and we all drive cars, trucks, and so forth. So these, these vehicles emit something called oxides of nitrogen. We call it NOx, is that here? And then also emit vol volatile organic compounds many many different types of organic compounds so what these these are called precursor gases and what they do is they make uh, a noxious soup that we call photochemical smog uh, that's the that's the scientific term but in general news media you hear the term smog and what is this smog it's like uh, photochemically produced ozone from all these pollutants emitted by car and then also the air so what happened during the COVID-19 when we went into a lockdown, we suddenly decreased the human activity. So then we said, okay, can we actually measure this from our satellite data and then the ground monitors? So we started a project called COVID project across different line offices within NOAA. And the satellite data we used are Tropomi. This is actually a European uh, satellite sensor that we partnered with ESA, the European Space Agency. So we get the data. So tropo, tropospheric monitoring instrument, and then we have our own NOVA satellite sensor called OMPS, ozone mapping and profiler suite. These two measure nitrogen dioxide that comes off of the cars. Then we have a satellite sensor called VIRS, visible imaging radiometer suite that measures the particle pollution. So we gathered this data in 2020 and then looked at the past data to see how the data changed because of the reduced human activity. And that's what I'm going to talk to you all. So what I'm showing here is the on-road emissions, that is the emissions coming off the cars from January through end of this year, roughly. So you can see that on any given day, uh, prior to the lockdown measures, you the cars were, this is, this is over Los Angeles, zooming into the Los Angeles, about 200 tons per day of emissions coming off of the cars. And these downward spikes you see is the weekend values. So actually in the data, you can see how high the emissions are on weekdays versus the weekends, right? Once the pandemic related lockdown started sometime in middle March, you can see this downward trend here. That is the reductions in the emissions. We were still driving, but not as much as the pre-pandemic level. And then we went into the post-pandemic phase very soon, uh, sooner than I think we should have. So there is an uptick and then the emissions started to come back to the near normal, but nowhere near the pre-pandemic. See, even in November, you're still at the reduced level compared to the pre-pandemic level. So this is what coming up of the cars. And then if we look at the power plant emissions nearby the Los Angeles city, the power plant emissions shown here on the y-axis on the right side in blue color, compared to 200 so or tons per day, you're only emitting uh, about like below 10 uh, tons per day. So the contribution from the emissions coming off of cars for poor air quality is much more significant than power plants. And then on the right here is, is a figure that compares now the, the same data we smoothed it for like a seven day running mean. So that's the blue curve now. And then we looked at the satellite data of the tropospheric NO2 column and the satellites don't see the near surface changes. They actually see the changes in the column. So we compute the column amounts. And then, you, and then the units are slightly different. They are now micromoles per square meters. And you can see that the trend you see in, in the on-road data that we gathered, the NOVA gathered from the ground versus the satellite, 
uh, the trend is consistent. There's a drop here associated with the lockdown that you see in the on-road emissions from the ground as well as in the satellite data. So satellite data are definitely showing and tracking the human activity. So now looking at the particle pollution, um, what we do is from satellites, we measure something called aerosol optical depth, and it is a good proxy for surface particle pollution. So what you have here on the left is on the top, the monthly averages of aerosol optical depth for 2019, and then on the bottom is 2020. And then you can see that the pollution, the, this is by the way, we actually isolated and teased out only the urban industrial pollution. So the natural sources of pollution like smoke you get from fires or the dust you get from dust storm, that's all teased out. So we are only looking at the urban pollution. You can see the urban areas and the most active areas, you have like a lot of pollution in Los Angeles and San Francisco area. And then if you look at the 2020, some of that is gone, right? And then now if you look across the other part of the globe, if over China, when the original pandemic started and then they went into a complete lockdown in February, much earlier than us, and you can see the climatology, meaning like, you know, the past years, the aerosol optical depth values, which means particle pollution is very, very high. And then in 2020, you can see a reduction, right? So, so the, definitely the lockdown has helped improving the or decreasing the pollution. But I want to draw your attention to the scales here. Now, typically the values are between zero to one. Uh, look at the scale for US, zero to 0.25. So the pollution in, if, even in the pre-pandemic time, pollution in Asia is four times on roughly higher than, higher than what we have in US. In US, because of the EPA regulations, uh, various uh, abatement strategies we have, so the pollution in general is much, much lower in US compared to Asia. But even that pollution you can see in the pandemic lockdown, you can actually improve that air quality. So the next thing we looked at is like, you know, how, how can we uh, detect the trends in economic activity using satellite data? And the human activity is related to the economic activity. So the one indicator we looked at is the unemployment rate. Uh, this, the top one is showing for April, 2019. The unemployment rate is like really good, like, you know, around 5%, maybe few locations higher than 5%, but overall very clean. But look at these values in April, 2020, pretty stunning numbers. Uh, if media reports, they, they will do a national average, but in individual metro areas, the unemployment rates went up as high as like 20, 25%. So then what we did was we differenced these two and then said, okay, as the unemployment rate increased, are we seeing an improvement in air quality? So which means decrease in the values that we measure from the satellite. So that's what plotted on the y-axis. You can see for the quarter one, when we didn't have the lockdown, so the, there is like net no, no change in unemployment rate, really significant change. So the values are all here in this dark blue. But once the unemployment change increased in quarter two and quarter three, you can see that the, uh, the pollutant concentrations is going down. And another thing you can see is between even quarter two and quarter three, when we actually started to come back to near normal, you can see this light blue, the cyan color dots moving towards these dark blue colors, and then the red ones are here, and because that's when we were in the height of the pandemic. So uh, in summary, so what did we learn? We learned that uh, in US, power plants are not major contributors, uh, but then um, we can actually track the human uh, mobility uh, using various indicators and then see that, okay, if there is actually reduced human activity, meaning reduced car pollution, which we can track. Um, what did it teach us? It taught us that we, maybe going into the future, we can look at alternate workplace policies such as telework, a shift towards electric driving electric cars, and reductions of other industrial activity. And then this may actually help improve air quality while still keeping unemployment rate low. Uh, we don't want un high unemployment rate as a solution with, for air quality. We want to have better air quality, but also very low unemployment rate. And in closing, I just want to um, show this, uh, the time series of the S&P 500 index that shows like some of the historic recessions of the, of the economic downturns. Of course, the 1929 Great Depression being one of the, the major ones that we talk about 
and also the 2008 stock market crash, 2020 lockdown here. So the, the question for us is uh, a Nova Y project that we started, what level of economic downturn can be detected in satellite data? So that's what we are trying to um, address with our project. And then just in closing, uh, this is a, a, we published a couple of articles on the work already, and then this is a slide showing the New York City, photograph of New York City that our collaborators from the University of Maryland took on March 28th during the height of the lockdown. You can see the city that never sleeps was actually sleeping, and then overlaid is the emissions drop in, in the New York City. With that, I want to conclude and thank my contributors. Zigong and Hai helped me analyze the data. Brian McDonald gave me the uh, the on-road emissions data, and Mitch Goldberg and Greg Post are the co-leads for this NOVA-wide COVID project. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shobha. That was an excellent presentation. You know, the ability for NOAA to address, um, to kind of turn on a dime and address problems like COVID-19 and both take advantage of these situations to advance research related to these such drastic changes is really important. Often our research um, is intentionally um, something that builds on itself and is a years long effort. But the ability to make these uh, quick pivots is, is really uh, great to see. So uh, thank you. And we'll move on to our last, our final speaker, um, Anna Klompen. Anna, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Great. Go ahead. All right. Um, so yes, my name is Anna Klompen, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Kansas. And I'm, uh, I have to say, really humbled to talk about this project. That was really a highly collaborative project on the stingy snot from the upside down jellyfish, which you can see here. Um, just because we're so short on time, I'm going to go a little bit faster than I was expecting, um, but I'm happy to take questions just via email after, and I think the slides are available as well. So I just want to mention the um, this uh, project incorporates some findings from my Hollings work when I was a Hollings scholar in 2015 and 2017 um, as a junior at the College of William and Mary. This is a, an article actually from when I received the scholarship. And I um, specifically wanted to design a project to work with Dr. Alan Collins of NOAA Fisheries um, because he worked on jellyfish. And I was really interested to work both on jellyfish and their toxins. And ultimately, really, that um, this Hollings Fellowship led me into my PhD now, where I work on venom evolution in this uh, other species of um, cnidarian, uh, the snail fur hydroid. Um, and that's currently, I'm a fourth year PhD working on that um, today. So to go back to the reason why we were looking at this, so this is an image, um, a video of several of these upside down jellies um, that we've put into a Petri dish. And as you can see, they have released so much mucus that effectively all of their water is now covered in it. So these jellies, um, Cassiope, are found all over the globe in mangroves and other warm, shallow waters. So they're really commonly encountered for snorkelers and scuba divers. Um, and while this mucus tends to stay attached relatively to the animal, when there's swimmers around that kick up this mucus into the water and it encounters um, your skin, it actually causes a stinging sensation that was called stinging water. And during my Hollings um, internship, there was actually two other high school interns that were really interested in looking at what it is about the mucus that causes the stinging sensation. But it turns out there was very little in terms of the literature on this. So when they started looking at the mucus more closely, they started noticing these little white specks that were released um, sometimes in the hundreds within the mucus. Uh, and there was no references to these kinds of structures at all. So when I was starting my PhD, I was really interested in figuring out interesting ways that jellyfish were using their toxins. And when I asked about this project, um, uh, uh, Dr. Ames actually invited me to come back and see if we could finish it up um, because at the time, uh, uh, the two high school interns had actually gone uh, off to college. So I came back to help finish out this project. And what we discovered and we described are these novel stinging cell structures that we called cassiosomes, um, cassio, cassio for cassiopeia and nematosomes for these superficially uh, similar stinging cell structures from a completely different species. And you can see these are pretty um, wonky structures. They're very irregular in shape, but consistently they have, if you see these bumps all along the edge here, 
Um, these uh, nematocytes are stinging cells around the outside, as well as what you can't see are a bunch of cells that actually have modal cilia sticking out. So these um, cell structures are modal. I'll have a video in a few moments. Um, and inside, you might see these brown specks in here as well. So Cassiopeia have endosymbiotic um, algae, symbiodinium, that live um, within their tissues that help them uh, take in sunlight to be used as food. And we found some of these same algal cells that were actually trapped inside these cassiosomes as well, um, though we're not sure what the function of those may be right at this time. So I'm going to skip this just for a second and just get to the punchline of this. Um, cassiosomes actually are composed of a single type of singing cell. Several types are present in the life cycle of uh, the upside down jellyfish, but the type that are in cassiosomes, these um, round O isoriza, are very specific to developing and mature medusa. So this is a very medusa specific or jellyfish specific mechanism that they're releasing into the mucus. And because I'm not, I'm going to try and kid myself that I'm an artist. We actually had a wonderful um, scientific illustrator that did a lot of um, work on this project, uh, doing these really beautiful images of the Cassie zones and some other figures in here. So I just wanted to shout out his work as well. So the next likely question we, um, we wanted to ask, and I'll have to get rid of the pen here um, for a moment. So uh, we want to ask is can cassiosomes subdue prey? And that would give us a good indication if they are able to subdue prey and relatively quickly, then it's likely they would also be able to um, sting and envenomate people as well. So here's these cassiosomes. This is um, real time. This is how fast they will kind of move around. And now I'm introducing these one day old brine shrimp or sea monkeys. These are typically what we feed jellyfish in culture. Already you can see um, how, how many of them are getting stung. And one minute later, the vast majority of these um, brine shrimp have been subdued or killed by just these cassiosomes. And if you'll indulge me for a minute when I point out, if you look right at the top middle corner here, you'll see a brine shrimp swim right into one and die almost immediately. So these are definitely very potent um, structures that are capable of subduing prey. And importantly, when we looked at mucus without these cassiosomes, it did not kill prey, indicating to us that it's really these cassiosome structures that are causing um, probably the problems of stinging water. The last thing I want to note is actually what my uh, related most directly to my Hollings project, which was not just on Cassiopeia, but actually this class of toxins called jellyfish toxins. Um, and these, uh, this family of pore forming toxins is best known as one of the core toxins responsible in the Australian box jellyfish, widely renowned as one of the most venomous animals on the planet. These toxins are highly hemolytic and cardiotoxic. And my project was essentially to look for these in outside of box jellyfish, so in several other different kinds of species that we wouldn't expect and are not necessarily dangerous. And I had actually found um, several JFTs within the upside down jellyfish. So it's partially the confirmation for myself, as well as to see if um, these potentially dangerous toxins were expressed in these uh, structures that were stinging people. We did some proteomics work and I'm still amazed um, at what we actually found. So we found all three of these transcripts for these JFT toxins in Cassiopeia, we found proteomic evidence for really good evidence um, in two out of the three. So this is just some of the um, mass spec uh, results as well as the coverage that we got from those mass spec. And these are samples both from cassiosomes isolated and then these appendages where we believe the cassiosomes are developing. Um, so we have confirmation that we have these potentially dangerous pore forming toxins within these stinging cell structures. So um, I do want to highlight that this is just four vignettes that came from our work. There's a ton that went into this project. Um, and I'll have the citation at the, at the end. Um, but all of these kind of came together to suggest that it's really these cassiosomes that are causing this widespread problem of stinging water uh, from these upside down jellyfish. And I know we're running out of time, but briefly, I just want to mention also some, uh, my Hollings work again was on this particular family of jellyfish toxins, not just on Cassiopeia. And I'm really, really happy to say that not only was I able to describe a whole bunch of new toxins for this, um, it actually became one of my thesis chapters, and we now have this um, project in review at uh, Genome Biology and Evolution. Uh, so I'm really excited for that, hopefully, to come out soon. So this is the citation. Again, this was the work of a massive collaboration, and I just want to give a special shout out to Dr. Collins, Dr. Ames, um, my co-first author, and of course, my PhD advisor, Dr. Um, Pauline Cartwright. Uh, and with that, I will stop sharing my screen, and thank you for <laughs> bearing with the speed on that.
Wow, that was great. Thanks Thank so, you much. so much. Yeah, thanks for being sensitive to time. I'll just turn it right over to Lisa. Wonderful. Thank you very much, everybody, for these great presentations. Um, audience, we've got about five minutes for questions, um, so please go ahead and type them in the question chat box on the right side of your screen. Also, um, make sure to let us know uh, if you're, you're addressing a specific person. And while you're um, entering your questions, I just want to remind you that our speakers have provided their slides as handouts. So if you are interested in keeping any of their slides, please go to the handouts drop down box um, on the right side to download either any of the four presentations. Um, we do have a first question. Uh, it's addressed to Andrew. So Andrew, this question asks, what is the proportion of total fish that are caught which die either because they're kept or because they die after release? Does the second vary by fish size? Um, so the proportion of fish that die because they're kept or because they're released? Well, I'm not really sure uh, that would, I'd have to know the I, off the top of my head. I don't know what the the number of fish there are. I mean, the 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 managers have an estimate of the total biomass, but I'm not sure what that is. Um, I know that uh, the 9%, it's assumed that 9% of fish that are caught and released end up dying. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's all I can give you on that one. Oh, that's good, great. Thank you very much for answering that question. Um, I'm still waiting for some questions to come in. Sometimes it takes a little moment to, to uh, for the software to process that. So um, I also want to remind people while we're waiting for more questions that this webinar was recorded. So we encourage you to share the link with interested colleagues. Um, you'll find the recording on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel, and I should have that link up a little later today. Uh, still waiting for questions. We. If uh, oh, here is here's another question. Um, this question says uh, is to Anna. Anna, if that toxin family is in all of these different jellyfish, why are some more dangerous than others? Yeah, that's a great question, and actually one that we were trying to um, explore in this paper that's coming out. So when we um, did some of the molecular evolution on this, we actually asked the very specific question, is there something different about the box jellyfish toxins than all these other species? And we have some indication that they are undergoing a different selection regime than the others. So it's it's likely that there's some something about the sequences that was selected upon for potentially um, just something very vertebrate specific, and therefore that's why it can sting us more than others. Um, that has not happened in some of these other species, possibly because they don't really hunt fish, um, really, or all of most of them don't hunt fish like uh, cubozoans. So that I hopefully the the paper coming out hopefully soon will uh, uh, address that. That's a great question and one I ask myself too. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, this next question is for Shoba. Were you surprised to not see more decline in pollution during the COVID lockdown? Were any other locations analyzed for comparison? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the um, satellites, the, at least with the NO2, so the emissions coming off of cars, I think the consensus is across the globe, like, you know, as we started seeing these measurements and then reports coming out of different parts of the world, about 30 to 40 percent but then there is also this um year to year variability in meteorology that we have to factor in um so so there are like some temperature dependencies and so forth so but i guess like people were still driving the the, the driving of the the traffic did not really it went down by 50 percent and then we we see a decrease, decline in pollution of about like you know depending on where you are like 30 40 percent so i think that's consistent with the amount of reduction in traffic so i guess i think we got a consistent result so i'm not surprised excellent this next question is also for you and i think this will have to be our last question today uh the question asks what time period was used calculating the changes in employment rate variable 
Oh, it's between, um, we looked at quarters, right? So, and then any metropolitan area that has in 2019 had greater than 2 million civilian workforce. So we looked at those regions and we just differenced the 2020 unemployment with 2019 for each quarter. Excellent, thank you for that information. Um, I just wanted to say that if your question was not addressed today, uh, it won't be ignored. Um, I'm going to send all the questions to our speakers who can respond offline. Um, thank you very much for, for uh, asking the questions. Any last comments from our pres presenters today? <clears throat> thank you, Lisa. Thank you to the presenters. And thank you for everyone who joined us today. Yes, I agree. Uh, and I'd like to conclude by thanking our speakers for sharing their work with us, as well as Neil and the NOAA Research and Development Enterprise Committee for organizing this series, which is just beginning. Um, the, the next net webinar is going to be on February 24th at 3 p.m., so I hope you'll be able to join us then. And to our audience, thank you, of course, for joining us for today's library seminar. NOAA Central Library is very proud to present the work of the NOAA community, and we hope you'll join us again. So be well, everybody. Take care. <laughs>